So you can open your Bibles to John chapter 2. And, um, you know, as... A, as, you know, just uh, going about the day, watching people. So many people are dealing with anxiety and with fear. And um, our world is approaching a dark time. The book of Revelation, you know, Jesus returning. Jesus said that, that men's hearts will fail them because of the fear of what's coming on the earth. And so, you know, basically what I would say is there is a storm brewing. Matter of fact, I feel like it's already starting. I'm going to believe we're in a storm, you know. And, um, you know, the only way you're going to stand, you know, it, 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 it's gonna, it all depends on the foundation that you have. There's only one sure foundation. Jesus said, if you hear his words and you do what he says, you're building your life on a rock. If you hear his words and don't do them, you're building on the sand. And it's interesting, both heard his word, but only one applied his word. So that's a huge theme for this message today is not just hearing hearing Jesus' word, but doing what he says. And um, that's when the foundation is going to be there. And it's interesting, you know, as you do what he says, you realize, and Jesus even said, if anyone does his word, you'll know if what he says is from God. And, you know, I've got 41 years of living applying this book. And I'm telling you, Jesus is of God. And, and what will happen is, as you read the word, as you live what he says, and, and I've seen it, as I've done what he said, and um, I've seen blessing, I've seen power, I've seen direction, I've seen his hand in my life. When I not when I don't listen to what he says, and says you sow the flesh and reap destruction, you're going to see problems. And um, you know this foundation, literally, you know of Jesus, you have stability, you have hope. You have peace. You know, Jesus is our rock. He's a sure foundation, a living hope, an anchor within the veil. He's our shepherd. You know, and, and the thing is, is how does this affect me? What happens when, when I'm in the Word and, is, you know, and I'm reading? There's two real main messages for the Bible, from the Bible. One is that God rules completely. He's in control. Nothing's happening outside of His control. And the other is that He truly does love me. Not just that He loves everybody. You can go, okay, yeah, God loves everybody. He loves the world. You've got to see that he loves you specifically. And you've got to be able to receive that. And I am, um, you know, John, the writer of this, he's called John the Beloved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And you guys have heard me say this many times. I don't, you know, how do we know this? Well, John tells us. Matthew doesn't. Mark doesn't. Luke doesn't. Paul doesn't. John tells us about himself. He said, "Hey, that's the one that, that's the one that Jesus really loved." You know, and, and the thing is, Jesus is not a respecter of persons, but in his own mind, we had, he had this sense that he was like a favorite. And I do believe, if you understand how much the Lord loves you, you will begin to believe you're a favorite, like he's. But he's treating you special. That's the very nature of his love. And so, but where do you get that from? Where do you get that sense? It only comes to this book. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. You can't trust someone you don't know. You don't know him unless you spend time with him, listening to him. As you spend time with God, listening to him in his word, he began to realize he really is in control. He really does rule. I've seen God just move in so many ways in my own life, not just on a worldwide scale. And he really does love me. And so that produces a peace and a rest. That's beyond word. I don't, I don't have anxiety. I don't have fear. I see the same things, but I know that God's in control, and I know that He loves me. You know, and that that love, perfect love, casts out fear. And so I want to pray that the Lord work that in each one of us here. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for you, Jesus. You are in control. That you do love us. And in the end, we need to just hear your word, and we need to do what you say. Lord, help us not just to stop with hearing. Help us to obey. And Lord, that's where you said we'll see, we'll know, we'll experience the reality that you are from God, that you are God in the flesh, and that our sins are paid for, you conquered death, we have a hope, we have eternal life, we have nothing to fear if we know you and follow you. And Lord, make this real to each person here, and I ask this in your name, Jesus, amen. 
in verse 1, chapter 2. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. Now, here's the issue. First of all, I have no doubt that Mary knew he was of God. Obviously, she delivered him. She knew the whole process, virgin birth. She had to, have some, had to have some indication that he had done supernatural things beforehand. We don't have record of that, but she knew he could deal with this. And she's kind of pushing the show along here. It's kind of like, okay, Jesus, let's get this show on the road. And um, you've got to put yourself in Mary's shoes for a second. Imagine you're a teenage girl. You're pregnant. And you go to mom and dad and say, mom, dad, um, I'm pregnant and, and God did it. How would she be seen? Just think about it for a second. Joseph, you know, he thought about putting her away, you know, as though she committed fornication. And he, but an angel appeared to him. So Joseph kind of got the picture, right? But again, put yourself in Mary's shoes. And listen, guys, word got out, okay? And she'd live with this hanging over her. Look at John 8 for a second. Go over there, John chapter 8. I want you to see a little conversation that happened with Jesus and the Pharisees. And um, start in verse 38. Oh, actually, verse 37. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I've seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. And they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I've heard from God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. And he's going to tell them their father's the devil. And look what they said. And they said to him, well, we're not born of fornication. We have one father but God. So they're telling Jesus what the word was, is that he was an illegitimate child. There was a time that fornication was looked down upon. There was a time having a baby out of wedlock would have been a dishonor. And it was in that day. And they're basically saying, well, you know what your mommy is. Okay. And so, so if you're in Mary's position and you have these rumors and you're being looked at as this fornicator, but you know better, you know that he's of God. God, you know, listen, she's wanting him to get the show on the road to show who he is. Come on, let's get moving. You know, she doesn't want to live under this cloud anymore. And so she tells him. And, um, and when it comes to Mary, by the way, you know, Jesus said to her, woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. Now, woman wasn't a derogatory term, but what's for sure is he's not lifting her up and putting her on a pedestal. Mary was a good example, okay? But how many Anyone, anyone here grew up Catholic? Who grew up Catholic? Okay. The cat, there's Catholic doctrines on Mary. I looked them up. I knew them already. She's not a co-redemptrix. What that means is they believe that she and Jesus paid for her sins. He suffered physically. She suffered on the inside. But she is also someone. So they call her co-redemptrix. Um... Um, she was not the mother of God. She was the mother of Jesus. There's a difference. He was born Jesus. Yes, she's the mother of Jesus. But he was God before being born. Does everybody realize that? He preceded her. So a mother of God means she'd be before him. She's not. She's not the mother of God. They call her that. And that was a doctrine added way later, centuries later. She is the mother of Jesus, not the mother of God. Also, she was not assumed into heaven. They, it's taught she didn't die. She just went up into heaven. And that comes from in Revelation where there's a woman clothed, clothed the sun and the moon, the 12 stars around her head, and they say that's Mary, you know, brings forth a child. The devil tries to get after her. She's rescued. They say that's Mary. No. Book of Revelation, every symbol you can find previously in the Bible. And in Genesis, Joseph has a dream, and he sees the sun, the moon, the 11 stars bowing down to him. He'd be the 12th star. And what it was, it was 
Jacob, his wife, and the brothers, okay, the 12 stars, sun, the moon, it's Israel. In Revelation, it's Israel bringing forth the Messiah. Then Israel is what the devil goes after. Does everybody see that? It's not Mary, and she was not assumed in heaven. She did not remain a virgin. And here's the thing. The way the Catholics have turned the doctrine of Mary, it's turned into this, look at this holy, wonderful, perfect person. And God used her because she was so holy, wonderful, and perfect. Well, how many of you feel like you could be used if that's the standard? That's not the message. The message of Mary is God took an ordinary, plain, old, average person, just like me and you, and did something amazing. That's the message of Mary, just like the disciples. Listen, Jesus prayed all night and chose the 12. He wasn't praying, Father, give us the best. He was praying, give us ones that when we use them, the world's going to say it's got to be God. <laughs> and look at those. The 12 were, they were really buffoons in a lot of ways. They were arguing out loud who was the greatest. Now, you might think you're better than someone else around you, but you wouldn't argue out loud. That's the toddler and that's little kids doing that. But the proof of what I'm saying is Mary's own word. Go to Luke 1. Mary herself backs up what I'm saying. And see, what, how many of you would say it's an awesome message to know that God could take an ordinary person and use them? Is that an awesome message? What does it say in 1 Corinthians? You see your calling, brother, not many wise, not many not noble, not many mighty as God called, but he's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So you might think you're a foolish person, hopeless, God will never use you. You know, you're the very person he wants to use. And if you look at Luke 146, it says this is when Elizabeth um, met her and, and John the Baptist jumped. Elizabeth shared a prophecy with her. Then Mary said, my soul does magnify the Lord. Hey, she worshiped the Lord. That's awesome. My spirit is rejoiced in God, my Savior. You know what that means? That means she needed to be saved. Some say she was sinless. She wasn't sinless. Only Jesus was sinless. Mary needed a Savior. Okay. And he has regarded, look at this, the lowest state of his handmaid. It isn't that I'm so great. I'm a nobody. Why would God ever use me? And guys, that's the picture. That's it. You know, why would God save me and use me? I'm a nobody. It's because of his grace. For behold, from henceforth all generations call me blessed. Now, you know, this whole idea, you know, blessed virgin. It's not like, it doesn't mean like holy, sinless, perfect. Blessed means, oh, happy. So who here would say it'd be a great honor to carry God? <laughs> I would say that's a huge honor. So that, 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 was a, that would make you happy. That's not you're like oh, perfect or sinless or something like that. All generations call, hey, Mary, that's an awesome thing you got to do. For he that is mighty has done great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. The God Gospel, Jesus is going to take the hot shots and bring them down, and he's going to take the nobodies and lift them up. That's what he's doing. Think of all the hot shot billionaires in the world who think they run the world. If they don't know the Lord, what are they going to end up with? What does everybody get when they die? The same little six foot hole in the ground. And, um, but if you know him, you could be the lowest person who's going to lift you up. He, he has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he sent away empty. He has opened, he has holden, helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham and to his seed forever and Mary abode with her three months and returned to her house now the number one thing that you could say about Mary that we all need to follow and learn from is the verse right before what I just read Elizabeth quoted basically what God was going to do with Jesus and look what it says verse 45 and blessed is she that believed. God made a promise. You're going to have a baby, even though you hadn't been with a man. And she believed. God's made a promise to you and I that through his son, your sins are washed away, forgiven. You have eternal life. You have a hope that no one can take away. Do you believe that? 
that's the key, guys. The key to not having fear, anxiety, you know, to having a sure foundation is believing that Jesus is the Christ, trusting in his word. If you trust his word, you're going to do what he says. That's when you have that foundation. Okay. And Mary believed. And then, you know what? She saw God move. We need to believe. And we're going to see God's faithfulness in our lives also. And um, what's interesting, too, I believe, I, Jesus is constantly being attacked on all sides, either those to replace him or to take him away. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Only one person you go through to get to God. I've actually heard people tell me that you pray to Mary and see she's kind of in good with Jesus and she'll get favors for you. It's like, is Jesus some grumpy, grouchy guy that doesn't want to help us? And so I got to go through his mother to help me? Nowhere are we told to pray through Mary or anyone else. You cannot pray through saints or Mary or anyone. You're not to pray to the dead. Okay? There's only one person who died who now is still alive. He raised from the dead. One mediator, one go between. And it's Jesus. And so any, be on guard for anything or anyone that tries. If a man, you you don't got to go through a priest for confession or anything else. That's called the Nicolaitans. Nico priest over the laity. Jesus said he hated that. Jesus wants you to go directly to him. And you can. And so go back to John 2. And, um, and so it says here, and actually one thing too, notice woman, I have, you know, what have I to do with thee? Now again, it's not a derogatory term, but he's definitely not lifting her up. My hour has not yet come. What's interesting is Jesus said he came to do the will of his father. He didn't say the will of his mother. Okay? And I'm sure he respected her. But the whole issue was she's trying to tell him to do something. Go to John 14. Look look what Jesus says. What, who directs him? And I'm certain at this point the father said go ahead and do this. But he's not doing it because Mary's telling him. He's doing it because his father told him. So John 14 verse 8 actually in verse, yeah, in verse 8 and Philip said Lord show us the Father and it will suffice us and Jesus said to him have I been so long a time with you that you've not known me Philip he that has seen me has seen the Father how do you say then show us the Father meaning Jesus was trying to give a perfect picture of the Father he had to stay in perfect contact fellowship with him and he had to do everything he said so believe thou not that I'm in the Father and the Father in me the words that I speak to you I speak not of myself but the Father that dwells in me he does the works. Notice he just put works and words together. Every word Jesus said is what the Father told him. All the works, he said he didn't do them, it was the Father doing them. So Jesus laid his deity down, he lived like us. He had to stay in perfect connection to the Father to reveal the Father. We're supposed to reveal Jesus. So we have to be in connection to him. You need to connect to Jesus where everything you say and everything you do he directs you. How many of you have had things where you've said things or done things you knew it was the Lord through you? Anybody ever experienced that? That's wonderful when that happens. We need to do that more. It's all the other words we say and do. How many of you have said things that definitely wasn't God? Okay, you need to keep, stop doing those things. But um, So go back to um, John here. So here, without a doubt, the Father has told him. And notice he says, my hour is not yet come. Jesus kept referring to his hour. The hour the purpose he came was to die on the cross. The program wasn't at that point yet. And go to John 7. Or, you know, right there, we're going to stay in this book of John. Look at 7, verse 30. I want you to see some places where he says this. Verse 30, it says, Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour is not yet come. There were times they tried to make him king. He avoided it. It wasn't time for that. Here they're wanting to kill him, but they're not going to kill him because it wasn't his time. Look at look at John 8, verse 20. It says, These words spoke Jesus in the treasure as he taught, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Hey, listen, guys, think about it. They wanted to kill him, but they couldn't touch him because it wasn't God's time. Do you realize no one can touch you or hurt you? If you're serving Jesus, no one can touch you until it's God's time timing. Okay, now, is it possible God might allow some of us to be martyrs? Is it possible? It is. But it ain't going to happen until it's His will, and if it's His will, He's going to use it for His purpose. John 12, go to John 12, verse 23. 
And Jesus answered and said, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So here, you know, he's, 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 he's approaching the cross. Look at verse 27. Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this cause I came to this hour. And he says, Father, glorify your name. And a voice came out and said, I've glorified him. Now glorify it again. So him glorifying the Father was going to be in the cross. If you look at chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the Feast of Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come, meaning he's hours before the cross. And then chapter 16, verse 32, Behold, the hour comes, and now come that you'll be scattered, every man to his own, and you'll leave me alone, yet I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. And then John chapter 17, verse 1, These words spoke Jesus, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. He's praying literally minutes before he's about to be arrested. And so go back now to John 2. So he wasn't at that point yet. I'm certain the father said, do it. And then look at verse 5, guys. The profound verse. The last recorded words of Mary in the Bible are right here. Look at verse 5. And this is a great theme to live by. And his mother said to the servants, important point, whatever he says to you, do it. You want, you want something to live by? Every area of life, whatever Jesus says, do it. And it's interesting. It says, he said it to the servants. Look, you're either serving yourself, you're serving the world. You know, what are you a servant of? If you're a servant of Jesus, you've said to him, Lord, take me, I'm yours. Have you done that? Have you ever said, Lord, my life belongs to you? To the servants, he said, or she said, whatever he says, do it. And what's interesting is in Matthew 7, Jesus said, if you hear my words and do what I say, you're building your life on a rock. The wind, the rain, the floods come, beat upon the house, it stood. If you hear my words and don't do what I say, then you're building on the sand. The wind, rain, floods come, and it's going to fall. Think about your life for a second. Are you hearing what Jesus said? Are you doing what he says? Listen, the Bible warns us, don't be just hearers, but doers. We can't substitute knowing for doing. You can read books on prayer, but do you pray? Okay, you can read on evangelism, do you evangelize? You know, the Bible says, forgive, do you forgive? When it says, give, do you give? Whatever Jesus says, do it. And again, he said to the servants, and then go back to chapter 2, verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. And Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, Draw out now and bear it to the governor. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning to set forth good wine and when men have drunk then that which is worse um, he says and you've kept the good until now you know the good wine obviously less fermented you know in the party everyone's eating drinking as they get drunk then the stuff that doesn't taste as good older they would give out and um, a couple of things to point out here and um, the fact first of all who saw the miracle it says the servant saw. Here, how many of you want to see sir, see miracles in your life? Listen, guys. The servants had to hear Jesus' word because he told them what to do, and they had to obey it. You know, the Bible tells us that God will confirm his word with signs following. We're not to follow signs and wonders, but they're going to follow us. And so notice Jesus told them what to do. He gave his word. They obeyed. When they obeyed, they saw miracles. And, and, and you got to put yourself in their shoes for a second. You know, he tells them to go fill these things with water. Okay. Now go take some and give to the governor. And they're kind of like... You know, they had to have wondered, right? Because the governor's expecting wine. Didn't make sense to them, but they're told to do it. And you know, guys, sometimes things God tells us isn't going to make sense. And it's funny, did, you know, did it turn while they were carrying it? You know, you wonder if it was water up until... 
and touch the guy's lips. But they had to trust his word. They had to obey his word. And I'm telling you guys, when you obey God's word, you'll see supernatural things. We're not to follow signs and wonders, but they'll follow us. And I've seen, you know, just last service, my mind was flooded with things. But it's always in the context of reaching out and giving out his word. Matter of fact, this whole thing of giving the little bags to the homeless, I know something's going to happen supernatural. I just know it. I had a flashback last week. We had a little meeting here. Um, Hurricane Hugo had happened. And um, it was the same thing. I just felt like the Lord said, do something. I didn't know what to do. Finally, I told some people, made an announcement. It got on the radio. We ended up filling up some trucks. Went down to South Carolina. And um, we were down there. My van broke down. So we go into a Walmart or whatever it was down there. But because of the disaster, everything was bought up. All the supplies and all the tools were bought up. And so it was a simple repair, but I had zero tools. And so we all got in a circle. There was about eight of us. Lord, help us. Please give us some tools. In Jesus' name, amen. Literally, at that moment, I see a guy walking from the door of the, the store, walking up past us, and I, and I followed him. And as I got to his car, his license plate, he had a bumper sticker, said, God's my pilot. And I said, hey, do you got some tools? He goes, yeah, I got a whole trunk full. And I said, oh, okay, can we borrow some? He said, sure. So he comes over, pulls around, and we're working on the car. 15 minutes into working on it, he goes, you know what, guys, I just got to tell you something. I go, he said, I left this place. I drove away, and God told me to come back. He said, I parked my car. I walked around this store wondering why God sent me here, and I kind of felt dumb, thought there was no reason. He said, then I walked out. Here's the thing, guys. He sent him away came back before we ever started praying. And as soon as we say amen, he's walking by. Let me tell you something. You could say that's a coincidence. I don't think so. <laughs> you know, and I just had this sense, and I'm telling you guys, I can give you so many stories of when you apply, when you give out God's word, when you do what he says, he will do things that are beyond coincidence. Okay, that you can, you'll see his hand in your life. How many of you want to see God's hand in your life? The servants do the miracle. Just keep that in mind. And um, so verse 12, where are we at here? It's, uh, verse 12, and, and this is the beginning of the miracles that Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifests his glory and his disciples believed on him. Again, we give out God's word. And God will confirm his word to signs following. We don't follow signs and wonders. They follow us. And, 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 he, and they saw the supernatural. And I'm telling you guys, I, I could sit here all day tell you 40 years of supernatural things that cannot be coincidence. God moving. And it's always in the context of obeying his word, giving out his word. So verse 12, and after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. Notice, first of all, he had brothers. Another passage says sisters. Mary did not stay a virgin. It said that Joseph knew her not until Jesus was born. So until, that word there means that it was normal afterwards. And he did have brothers and sisters. And notice that the brothers are not listed as disciples because up to this point, the brothers didn't believe. They didn't believe until after the resurrection. So he had brothers, but they're not listed as disciples because they weren't, you know, and because they, they, they were skeptics when the re resurrection happened. And you can put yourself in their shoes. Imagine your, your mom tells you that your older brother's God. <laughs> you might be a little skeptical. You're wondering, why doesn't Jesus ever get in trouble? Why don't you really yell at him? You can see Mary saying to the younger ones, why don't you act like your brother Jesus? We can't. We have a sinful nature. He doesn't have one, you know. Anyway, but, um, but they didn't believe until after the resurrection. And then verse 13, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, which the adult males had to go. Um, in verse 14 it says, And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers of money and overthrew their tables. And he said to them that sold doves, take these things and out. Make not my father's house house of merchandise. 
And so this was done at the beginning of his ministry. We know the other Gospels list that it happened at the end of his ministry. Again, he actually does this twice. Here was the situation. If you came up for a sacrifice and you brought a lamb, okay, and there was a lot of animals that could sacrifice, you know, they can give ox or sheep, poor would give doves, but they had to be flawless. And so let's say you traveled days, you brought this sacrifice, you come up to the temple, the, the priest would inspect it. Well, they would always find a flaw, but they would have temple approved animals. Thing is, is they jacked the price up on them. And so you had to pay more to get one of those. Also, if you were going to give money, you couldn't give Roman money. So they exchanged the money for temple money. But the thing is, the exchange rate, we're going to charge you. And it was a huge rate to exchange your money to give to God. And so needless to say, Jesus wasn't too happy. The issue was using God to make money. God hates this. I hate this. He said, freely receive, freely give. That applies to the ministry of God's word. We're here to give out God's word to you. Okay? We're not charging money. We're not trying to use that to make money. Sadly, would you guys say this has been abused? Churches have fleeced the flock, pressured and manipulated. Now, there's a couple principles. We are to give. Okay, Proverbs 3, 6, and 7 is this honor the Lord of the first fruit to your increase, that your barns burst out with plenty. That's not even in the law. That's a proverb that Solomon observed. Honor with the first fruits means when you get paid, when you make money, honoring is you're saying, God, I'm thanking you for this. I'm honoring you. And it says the first fruits. Don't give God the leftovers, give it out the first. And then Paul made it clear in 1 Corinthians that what is given is for the functioning of the church and ministry. And he used the temple as the model. The reality is, guys, ministry costs money. You guys realize this isn't my building? <laughs> this is your building. Okay? And it just, it's just practical life. The reality is, is that what people give is what allows ministry to happen. But the problem is, again, it's been abused where people have been pushed, pressured, and manipulated. And I hate it, guys. I hate it so much. Matter of fact, if you if you ask the average person on the street why they don't go to church, they'll give two reasons. One, they'll say it's full of hypocrites. Okay, and, and I don't think that's a valid argument because how many of you want to do the right thing and you fail sometime? Anybody? Okay, that's weakness. That's not hypocrisy. There are open hypocrites. You just tell them, look, okay, come to church and you can add another hypocrite if you want because you're not going to be perfect either. But then they'll say it's all about money. And there's truth in that. And when I, I, I'll take that and I'll use that in my favor. I'll say, you know what? I agree. You know what? I hate that. Jesus hated that. And I tell him, and this is something you tell people about this church. We've never once in 28 years, we've had many needs. I've never got up here and told you guys. I've never asked, begged, or manipulated. And I've not done anything to pressure. I grew up, anybody, whoever, who here grew up Catholic? Anybody grew up Catholic? Okay. I remember going to my grandma to a Catholic church. She'd give us, you know, little boys. We'd give us quarters. They would have a basket on the end of a pole, and a guy would go down the aisle, and he would, you know, reach it right down the, <laughs> you know, the whole length. And if you didn't give, it would like hover right in front of you. I watched that. It would go down. It'd be like this. That's called pressure. Would you say that's pressure? And I'm certain people pulled money out because they didn't want to be embarrassed, not be seen giving anything. You know, my grandma always gave us money just to stick some in there. And then, and then here's the thing, too. But then there's also manipulation, you know, um, where, um, again, they can have big soft stories about needs. I, I remember sitting in a church, I won't tell you about nomination, they bought a big building, and it was a huge mortgage. And halfway through the message, somehow they must have tipped the guy what the offering was, and it wasn't enough to pay the mortgage. He stopped and know the message, and he said, it would be like saying, we have a $10,000 mortgage, and we only got $6,000. i am not going on until... So someone would go, 500000 He would not go on until 
the amount of money was given. That was just, just made me want to throw up, okay? Again, manipulation, pressure, but, but the ultimate manipulation is when they tell you, and see, it says in Second Peter 2, um, 1 and 2, he says there'll be false teachers who through covetousness with feigned words will make merchandise of you. Merchandise of you means they're, all, they're trying to get your money, but they're using covetousness. Here's, here's, the, here's the method. If you give, you're going to get the hundredfold blessing. You know, so they tell you to give so you can get. Wrong motive. You don't give so you can get. You give out of thanks for what God's given you. How many believe everything that you have is from God? And so when you give, it's out of thanks. And so, like you said, guys, that's why I will never do things to manipulate or pressure. In our bookstore, a lot of churches have a lot of money-making businesses. Our bookstore up there does not make money. It covers the cost. We pass the cost on to you so you can get things at a reasonable price. We're not making money on that. You know, we have we, may, we charge enough to add a little bit to it. The, book, the, the food up here, we're not making money. There's churches do fundraisers and bake sales. They do all these things to make money. We don't make, we're not making Making money off. We're just covering the cost. It's cheap. It's easier for people to stay here and eat and fellowship afterwards than have to run out to McDonald's or whatever. It's conducive to fellowship. But but a lot of times churches do these things. They'll do retreats. Our retreats are the cheapest. You'll never find a retreat cheaper. Why? Because we don't mark it up. <laughs> we we if we come out even. I want it, whatever people pay for a retreat, I want it to come out just enough to cover it, right? But I'm telling you right now, guys, I know churches make big bucks. Uh, you know, if it costs them 140, you know, they'll charge 180 and make 40 bucks a person. I, I know it happens. And um, we're not going to do that. Here's the thing. There's two kinds of churches, two kinds of people. There's sewers and there's springs. Sewers is sucking everything in. It's trying to get all they can. Springs, it's flowing outward. See, my job is to give out God's word Word, and if God touches your heart, if he ministers to you, Paul says that's where you should give, but it's out of thanks. Something in you should say, God, you're so good. I want to give to you out of thanks. I want to support your word going out. It's something you should want to do. And as people give, see, then this church, we want to be a blessing to the city. There's all kinds of ministries. Every Sunday, we take a tenth of what's given and give it to another ministry. There are so many ministries who have used this building for different things. And to this day, I've never charged any of them. Okay, and I've had people say, oh, you need to charge money for that. No, I do not want to be known as a church that's all about money. I want to be known as the opposite. How many of you want to be known like that? You know, I want to be a spring. I want life to flow out. And so, needless to say, Jesus wasn't happy. He made a scourge, which is a whip. And it's, now, Chuck was talking about this, and he said, there is a controversy, a question. Someone said, but did he hit him with it? And, he, and someone said, well, it doesn't say he hit him. But Chuck said, but it doesn't say he didn't hit him either. And here's the thing. When it says, look what it says here. It says he, um, when it says he, wait a minute, he, um, where is it at? My smoker, he drove them. Drove, it has the notion of violence. Because listen, anger is not sin, by the way. Wrath is. I don't think he was out of control, but he was angry. Was he angry about this? Hey, you're turning my dad's house for prayer and you're trying to make money. You're using God to get rich. It makes me mad. He was mad. And then it says he um, overthrew the um, they report out the changers money so just picture that one for a second picture just quarters and money just rolling around and what do you think they were doing you know probably on their hands and knees right I don't think he gave him time to pick it up I think he chased him out and they'll go to says here and he overthrew the tables I don't think it was excuse me fellows why I did this I think he's like get this stuff out of here and listen there's this image of ministry and pastors and of Jesus of this wimpy guy listen he was a carpenter which and that day most likely it was a stone mason. Okay, stones, working with stones. Do you think you're some weak, wimpy dude? I don't think so. I think Jesus was tough. I think he was rugged. I think he was a man. And um, listen, they wouldn't have run if he was some wimpy sissy guy. Do you realize that? <laughs> I don't know. I love this. I think this is great. And he wasn't putting up with this garbage. You know, but just an interesting picture of Jesus. He was meek, but he wasn't weak. Do you realize that? See, sometimes we associate meekness with weakness. No, he was strong. And they got out of there because they knew he meant business. And I love it. And we need more of that. Man, can you imagine if he did that in churches today? 
Because the thing is, we need to treat everything that comes into the church as it's his, and we need to do everything for his honor, his name. And then verse 17 is, and his disciples remember that it was written, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Now, he's quoting Psalm 69. Go there, and I want you to see what he's talking about is God's house Jesus cared about. Do you care about God's house? He cared about it. And they're quoting, and it's a messianic psalm. It's pretty powerful, actually. And it's kind of Jesus' perspective as he came, what was in his heart you know, when he went to the cross. Um, verse, um, where are we at here? Let's go verse 7, Psalm 69. Because for thy sake I've borne reproach, shame has covered my face. I've become a stranger to my brethren, an alien to my mother's children, meaning Israel and his own brothers rejected him initially. For the zeal of your house has eaten me up. I'm angry over the fact that your house is being dishonored. And the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me, meaning people, you know, the, the sin was put on Jesus. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garments and became a proverb to them. They that sit at the gates speak against me, and I was a song to the drunkards, meaning when he was being crucified, they were making fun of him. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me. In the truth of thy salvation, deliver me out of the mire. Let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up. Let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw near unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. You have known my reproach and my shame, my dishonor, my adversaries are all before me. Reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I looked for some to take pity. There was none. For comforters I found them. So no one, you know, when he was on the cross, he felt alone. They have given me gall for my meat and for my thirst. They gave me vinegar to drink. So you know that's totally talking. That's Jesus, what he was thinking on the cross. So go back now to um, um, John. And in verse, um, we're in verse... 18, then answered the Jews and said to him, what sign do you show us seeing that you do these things? And so he's, you know, they're asking for a sign. Jesus answered and said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in the building where you reared up, reared up in three days. But he spoke of the temple of his body. So first of all, signs, evidence, proof. He's pointing to the resurrection. There's actually three things Jesus points to. One, is the miracles. Sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, raising the dead. You know what's interesting? Jesus is the only leader that there's any record of doing those things. There's no record of Muhammad giving sight to the blind. There's no record of any other religion anywhere doing anything supernatural except Jesus. What's interesting is when you look at the history of every religion, there's only one religion that actually has a history. Church history has story after story after story of supernatural. People being healed. Sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, raise the dead. All those things have happened through throughout history. Yes, some might have been fake, but it's the only religion that even has the stories of them. Um, when it comes to prophecy, God challenges every other religion. He says, tell the future, we'll see if it happens, and we'll know if you're a God. So challenge the Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists. Is there anything in your writings that tell the future? Big zero. God says, who is like me that tells the end from the beginning? God's outside of time. Only one book has prophecy over 3,000 in this book. Guys, this is called proof. This is called evidence. The miracles and the prophecy. But here, he's pointing to the resurrection. Josh McDowell was someone who set out to disprove the resurrection and Christianity became a Christian. And, and at one time, there was a attorney general that took the resurrection story and applied all the courts of law as though it was on trial. And there's only one possibility. And there was actually a movie that came out a couple years ago. And there's one line in it that I just love. A guy who was a skeptic, he said, all I know is a man who was certainly dead three days later was certainly alive. And then there it is, guys. Only one person conquered death. And what's interesting is in Acts 17, God says he's appointed a man who will judge the world. 
And he said that he did it by this, and that he raised him from the dead. Meaning that the resurrection is so powerful, there's so much evidence, it's such solid proof that God will hold you accountable. Heaven or hell will be decided about what you think about the resurrection. And it, what does it tell us in Romans 10? Confess with your mouth, Jesus, Lord, and believe in your heart, what? That God raised him from the dead. Because see, Jesus said your sins are paid for on the cross. The proof is when God raised him from the dead. It was the Father saying, I accept the sacrifice. That means everything he said before was true. And so if Jesus raised from the dead, then my sins are forgiven. And so it's, it's serious evidence. And notice here, he says, destroy, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. It says he spoke of his body. Realize something, guys. You're not your body. You live in this body. You're going to leave it. It's actually called a tabernacle. Well, think about this. In the Old Testament, me the tabernacle which is a tent it was temporary eventually the temple i think that's a great picture we all get a tabernacle we're getting a body that's that's fading away do you guys realize your bodies i did read a really cool story though yesterday they said exercise you can really slow it down they did a they did a survey they took all these guys who exercise five hours five days a week 70 years old they compared them with other 70 year olds and with 25 year olds and they were physically the same as 25 year olds not other 70 year olds so that's the thing is but you're eventually gonna lose right it's, it's, this body's going to turn to dust. So guess what? What do you need when this body's gone? You need a new one. Go to go to Second Corinthians. In first service, I didn't go into detail on this, and I should have, because somebody was confused and came up to me afterwards and talked to me. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. So you guys are getting a little bit extra than what first service got. But um, 2 Corinthians 5, look what he says here. And I want you to keep in mind, remember Jesus said in John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go prepare a place, I'll come again and receive to myself. People picture this like, oh, I got some big old, you know, 10 bedroom, three bathroom with a jacuzzi, you know, house waiting for us. It's not what he's talking about. In my father's house are many mansions. It's dwelling places. He's talking about a new body. And, and this gives the context, it kind of gives you the picture. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, meaning turned to dust, when your body that you're in now dies, we have a building of God. God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's the mansions Jesus is talking about. This dwelling place. Your soul will live somewhere. Either it, when it leaves this body, it's going to be with the Lord. Look here. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Meaning, how many of you can't wait to get that new body that won't die, no suffering, no pain, no cancer, nothing like that? If so be we clothed, we will not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not that we should unclothe, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that has wrought the self thing, the same thing for us is God who has given us the earnest of the Spirit. The earnest of the Spirit means the down payment. If you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit in you, then you're getting a new body. Okay? And that's what Jesus said is this waiting. And it's, and, and it's going to be like His body. His body appeared and disappeared. It ascended to heaven. It went in and out of rooms without going through the door. I think it sounds pretty cool. Wanna, imagine having a body where you just think and you want to be there. Our body's going to be like His body. Matter of fact, it says we'll be like Him because we'll see Him as he is. And so I can't wait for that. But go back to um, John. And so verse 20, it says, oh no, no, not verse 20, verse, um, hold on, verse 23. No. Verse 22, when, they, okay, when he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So notice, you know, his word caused faith, believing the word, and when they saw the resurrection, it confirmed it. And so verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. 
But Jesus did not commend himself to them because he knew all men. He needed not that any should testify of man because he knew what was in man. Here's what was happening. They saw something supernatural. They were excited. They saw miracles. John said there was more miracles than he can write down. The problem is miracles and supernatural things, they do not produce faith. The two generations in the Bible that had the greatest miracles were Moses and Jesus. And they're both called generations of unbelief. Why is that? Because faith only comes by God's word. Go to Romans 10. We're almost done here. Romans 10. I want you to see this. I want you to read this yourself. Romans 10. Verse 17. Listen, guys, you're saved by faith, by pleasing. Uh, that's what pleases God. Well, verse 17. So then faith comes by what? Supernatural things and miracles? No. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Listen, faith is your trust in God. The only way you trust him is if you get to know him. The only way you get to know him is by reading this book. That's why guys were told one thing is needful. It's like manna every day. Every day you need to have God speak to you. And I'm telling you, if you read this book, you're going to find that every day is going to tell you what you need for that day. This is where you're going to learn that God is in control. Let me tell you something, guys. I've had 41 years of reading this book. I know God rules completely. I have such a rest in my heart. He totally rules in everything, including everything in my life nothing happens by coincidence and you know what he loves me and you know what I have nothing to be afraid of I just I do not live in fear ever okay it's not because I'm some great person it's because I've had 41 years of learning this book and you know what as you learn this book and you do what he says listen this is where you trust him the problem is so often supernatural things emotional highs all this stuff you know okay yeah, you'll have the emotional highs. You'll have the great blessings, but you also have valleys. You have struggles. There's hardship. And listen, guys, you cannot trust your feelings. You cannot trust emotions. You cannot trust your circumstances. And if you find your Christian life is this up and down thing, it's because you're trusting your emotion, trusting your circumstances, trusting something else other than God's word. What does he say? He said, I'll never leave you what? Or forsake you. He's with you always. He said, go into all the world and preach gospel every creature in this. See, and the only way you're going to come to this, the only way, and I start off this message by saying our world is filled with people with anxiety and fear. You need a solid foundation under you. You need to read God's word. You need to get to know him. Spend time with him. Listen to him. Make Jesus your best friend. He's going to reveal himself to you. And then, what's the theme of this message? Whatever he says, do it. Start applying what Jesus says, whether it's sharing your faith, giving, forgiving, being a servant. You know, the servants are the ones that saw the miracles. How many of you want to see miracles in your life? And I'm, I'm going to end with, um, in Mark 16, go there, and um, I want you to think about this. As you get to know him, as you get to know his word, something in you should just fall in love with them, and you should be blessed. God's going to bless your life. As you receive God's goodness, his grace, his blessings, as you see supernatural things, you're going to want other people to experience that. I've heard someone describe this life as knowing Jesus and making him known. As you get into the word, as you get to know him, man, you just, you, again, you're going to realize, Lord, you're in such control. You do love me. And so you're going to want to start doing what he says. What does he say? Well, look at Mark 16 verse 15. He said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Tell everybody what you found. If the Lord's blessed you, how many would say the Lord's blessed you? Then go tell people. Are you glad your sins are washed away? Are you, you know, you're glad Jesus raised from the dead? And so look at verse 19. So that after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. So you, you learn the word, you need to apply it. Part of applying it is sharing God's word. As you share God's word, God's going to confirm what signs and following. But you know what happened between verses 19 and 20? A very significant event called Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured upon them. You don't have the power to do this without the Holy Spirit helping you. How many of you want the Holy Spirit to help you. 
And Jesus said, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So you can ask, how often do you think you should ask for that? I'd say as often as you need them, which is every day, right? I pray that more than anything. The Lord, fill me with the Spirit. We need to learn of Him. That's where faith comes from. Then we need to do what He says. But that only comes by the Spirit. How do I know this? Because His Word tells me. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for everyone that's here. And Lord, just open our eyes to the reality that You're the Christ. Lord, that, um, that like Mary said, whatever You say, we need to do. And Lord, we're going to see miracles if we do that. And Lord, the servants saw the miracles, the ones who listened to you and followed you. And so Lord, I pray that um, you'd reveal to everyone here through your word how much you love them, how much you're in control. And Lord, that we would want to live what you say, that we want to tell others what you've said. And Lord, help us to go out of here just overflowing with your light in your life. And Lord, we can't do it without your Holy Spirit. So we ask right now, Heavenly Father, baptize us and fill us again with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, help us to see that it's all that really matters is knowing you and making you known that, you, that you are, you've got eternity waiting for us, a new body. And um, this one's going to turn to dust. We need a new one. And so does everyone else we meet. Help us to tell them about you and about eternal life. And Lord, we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. May this be a week that you recommit to learning about the Lord, finding out that he's in control, that he loves you, and that you go out of here filled with the Holy Spirit. When we're singing this song, it's it says, be filled with the Spirit, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. As we're singing, I want you to praise God, but expect Him to fill you with the Spirit. So God bless you guys.